replicator technology is one of the most iconic and awesome pieces of Star Trek future tech. When people think of replicators, they only think of the ability to create food out of thin air, but replicators can do so much more. They can create tools, clothing, or organs for transplant. Almost anything you can imagine can be created with a replicator. Awesome, awesome replicators. So, of course, the matter for a replicator has to come from somewhere. Aboard the International Space Station, the majority of water used by the Americans is recycled, either from urine, shower runoff, or droplets of water in the air from breathing and sweating. Lovely. But how long is it until we take the next step? How far away are we from being able to literally eat shit? Star Trek's replicator technology. Within the Star Trek universe, replicator technology has gone through several iterations. First, it was the protein resequencer. Explanations of how all these technologies work are fairly limited and not always consistent, so we're going to have to do our best to guess at some of the details here. As best we can determine, the protein resequencer works by breaking down matter at a molecular level and holding it in some sort of matter storage area. This is particularly performed on human waste. The molecules are then reassembled into things like meatloaf or mashed potatoes. I'm beginning to realize that replicators are less awesome than I think because that meatloaf came from Kirk's feces. This is a much more complicated process than anything we are capable of right now. Though the ISS can turn pierce into drinking water, it's a relatively simple process of boiling and purifying the liquid. We aren't trying to reconstruct water out of ambient hydrogen and oxygen molecules here. After the protein resequencer came the food synthesizer, the technology that appeared on Star Trek the original series. The food synthesizers were more advanced, at least canonically they're supposed to be. They seemed to be capable of making a much wider variety of foods, and they utilized what were essentially recipe cards, punch cards that were inserted into the synthesizer to tell it what to make. Despite being allegedly more advanced, much of the food crafted by the food synthesizers came in the form of colorful cubes of nutrition. And it also used a punch card system. This was likely just a design choice to either make the show look more futuristic or to play into what people assumed space food would be like. Though there were allusions to the fact that the material used by these machines could be used to create things other than food, food was the whole point of them. And then came the rest of it piece of Star Trek technology that is simultaneously the coolest and also somehow the stupidest. Replicators were based on transporter technology and harnessed power from the warp core to convert energy into matter. They would not only create your cup of tea, Earl Grey hot, but uh, they would also create the mug as well. Plates, cutlery, and anything required for a meal were all generated by the replicator. They used dishes and any leftovers would be placed back inside the machine to be recycled, a process that saw the replicator convert the matter back into energy. Now Einstein told us that matter and energy are interchangeable and this has been proven to work and be true in both directions. However, the amount of energy required to perform such actions is astronomically large. To create a single cup of tea would require as much energy as produced by a 5 100 megaton nuclear bomb. Yes, really. And that's just for the liquid itself. It doesn't even address the fact that he's making a fancy glass mug. Now, obviously, a starship's warp core is capable of generating obscene amounts of energy, the kind of energy that would be required to somehow transport a giant ass ship faster than the speed of light. Even so, the energy requirements of the replicators are not negligible. In at least one instance, a Starfleet vessel had to ration the use of its replicators in order to conserve power for the warp engine. So the energy requirements of a replicator are great enough that they could hinder the operation of an engine that produces a fictitiously large amount of energy. The idea that we could easily convert energy and matter back and forth to replicate food and other items is certainly intriguing. But is this in any way possible? How far away are we? If the goal is actual replicators, then we are extremely far. Since replicators are canonically based on transporter technology and require the repeated conversion of energy to matter and then back again, the energy requirements are just far, far too high. Even if a replicator were theoretically possible, and we're still not fully convinced that it is, the energy requirements would be so absurd that it's not really worth any serious consideration yet. 
such energy generation is not yet even remotely feasible. So if the technology is possible, it is likely hundreds of years in the future. Now that's not to say that this extremely convenient dream is completely dead. As we said, replicators make more than just food. They can make anything. Now, it's not as fast or as magical a process, but we have created something very similar in the form of 3D printers. There are really only two main differences between a 3D printer and a replicator, or even the more basic synthesizers. First is the source of materials. Rather than converting energy into matter or assembling stray molecules in the air, 3D printers require raw materials normally in the form of some type of plastic or metal. The other difference is how long it takes to create something. Rather than making objects magically appear in seconds, a 3D printer can potentially take hours depending on the size and complexity of an object. That's not to say that the current technology is not impressive. You provide instructions on what to make, the printer will assemble countless layers of molten plastic or metal, building it into any shape you can imagine. It is an invaluable technology and one that is currently employed aboard the ISS. Sending supplies to the ISS is extremely expensive and sometimes they'll need something that they couldn't have predicted. By equipping them with a 3D printer, they can just tell the computer what they need and it will make one for them. And we also now have the ability to 3D print food, though the application is currently rather limited. The types of food that can be printed are restricted by the printing technique and it focuses heavily on things like cheeses, purees and chocolate. It's interesting achievement, but it's not as revolutionary as a regular 3D printer. A regular 3D printer can turn a spool of plastic or metal into a hammer, socket wrench, or even a gun. On the other hand, while 3D printed food can turn chocolate into a beautiful sculpture of a Victorian house, was there any reason to? The previous materials were useless before being transformed into tools, but the chocolate, it was already delicious. The problem with 3D printed food as an analog for replicators is that you need to already have the food, which kind of defeats the whole point. However, there are breakthroughs being made that could make something more similar to a Star Trek star replicator a reality. The first is a new style of 3D printer that focuses on speed. It can create objects in a matter of seconds, and the researchers have even nicknamed this the replicator. They like to say it only takes seconds, but the process is actually closer to two minutes. Either way, though, it's still really impressive to watch. Created at the University of California, Berkeley, the replicator 3D prints an entire object simultaneously rather than layer by layer. The key to this technique is a synthetic resin called acrylate. It's in in its liquid form, acrylate will solidify when exposed to certain intensities of light. To utilize this, the researchers filled the cylinders with the liquid resin and projected the image of the item that they wanted to create onto the cylinder using an off-the-shelf slide projector. Onlookers can watch the object materialize within the vial of liquid as if by magic. Now, this isn't going to have any applications in terms of food, but for the replication of inedible things, it demonstrates that 3D printing technology still has a lot of potential for advancement. Unfortunately, this technique is currently limited to printing objects that are only a few centimeters tall. The next breakthrough is by far the most promising, though. A New York-based startup called MatterShift is promising to change the world forever. The company was founded by alumni from Yale and MIT, and they're basically trying to build a replicator. More specifically, they're trying to create a molecular factory. This is a theoretical device that would perform the same tasks as a replicator, but it would do so using the much more realistic technology that's described in the protein sequences and food synthesizers. MatterShift has succeeded in creating large-scale carbon nanotube membranes that are capable of separating and combining individual molecules. This was already possible with smaller carbon nanotubes, but the larger nanotubes will have a major impact on the research. A study published in the scientific journal Science Advances confirmed that MatterShift's larger nanotube membranes performed just as well as the smaller ones. However, currently the research with smaller nanotubes has been restricted to labs at universities because you can't just go to Walmart and pick up a bag of tiny carbon nanotube membranes. We're all very disappointed. And with the larger ones, you're still not going to be able to do that, but the larger scale dramatically reduces both the cost and complexity of production and should allow the research to expand throughout multiple industries. Right now, MatterShift's research is focused on removing carbon dioxide molecules from the air to turn it into fuel. This is something that was already possible using older technology, uh, but it was too expensive to have any practical application. But they believe that this is just the beginning. While each individual membrane can only perform one specific function, a machine utilizing different types of carbon nanotube membranes should be able to act as a molecular factory. If this technology works as expected, a factory would be able to create fuel, building materials, medicine, and yes, even food, out of thin air. 
It wouldn't be the same technology that was used in Star Trek's replicators, but it would perform the same function without needing, you know, millions of billions of joules of energy to perform a simple task. T. Oh, gray. Hot. Should we want replicators? The writers of Star Trek sure didn't want them. In an interview, Next Generation and Deep Space Nine writer and producer Ron Moore discussed how the replicators destroyed storytelling and were reviled by the writing staff. Nothing was special and nothing had any value. You never had to worry about things breaking if the replicators could make all the spare parts that you needed. In terms of compelling writing, there are certainly arguments against replicators. But what about in the real world? We don't live in a story. Give us our goddamn replicators. A post-scarcity society may have the disadvantage of removing a lot of the potential plot elements that currently exist, but it would also have the advantages of, you know, being a post-scarcity society. Wouldn't a world where we can easily ensure that every single person's basic needs are met be something that we should all absolutely want? And that's not even mentioning how convenient replicators would be or how endlessly cool they would seem, you know, at least for a while. And, Till we got bored. Now you're probably thinking, yes, of course we should roll replicators. How is this even a question, Simon? But you're also probably not a murderous psychopath, are you? Now, there's no indication on Star Trek that the replicators were technologically limited in what they could produce. And there's no indication that a real-world molecular factory would necessarily be constrained either. Sure, the Federation had lots of rules. Replicators couldn't make poisons, civilians could make clothes, but they couldn't make Starfleet uniforms, and anyone who was confined to their quarters had their replicator turned off so they couldn't make a weapon. Now, it's all well and good, but those were just rules. They weren't limitations of the technology. Any artificial limitations imposed by the government would almost certainly be able to be disabled by bad actors. It's nice to think how many of the world's problems could be solved if we all had magical wish-granting boxes, but then all the evil people would have wish-granting boxes too. Small nuclear device. Hot. <laughs> There's no telling what sort of peril such a person could unleash on the world. On the bright side, the technology focuses on separating and combining molecules, so it lacks a level of precision that would be needed to replicate some sort of civilization-ending virus. But they could still do plenty of bad sh In the end, the benefits of replicators would almost certainly outweigh the downsides. Bad people will do bad things, regardless of whether this technology exists, and there's a whole lot of upside to the technology beyond just convenience. Then again, uranium is as abundant as tin or zinc, so we could theoretically be handing dangerous people a nuclear bomb vending machine. But, you know, it'll probably be fine. <laughs> Hopefully. Wrap up. So, how far away are we from replicators? If we mean replicators as Star Trek portrays them as existing in the 24th century, we are extremely far, and they're probably not even worth creating. But, if we're talking about molecular factories that utilize the same type of technology as protein resequences or feud synthesizers, we might not actually be that far. Star Trek predicted that the protein resequencer would be invented by 2130. And it's not a terrible guess, actually. How long it will take is going to depend on what the research from Matter Shape and other companies that begin experimenting with large carbon nanotube membranes have to say. There are still several steps between where we are now and a molecular factory. But if the current research is successful, then there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't actually be possible. In theory, it should also be possible to skip all of the intermediate steps depicted in Star Trek and have something like a replicator far earlier than they predicted. Different applications may require different assortments of membranes, but either the technology works or it doesn't. If it can assemble a chicken sandwich, there's no reason it can't assemble a brick of C4. But like we said, it'll probably be fine.